Okay. Uh, so thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation. So I don't know if I advertised uh, the talk under the title Reductive Quotients of KLT Varieties. Anyway, um, this will be one of the upshots maybe that uh, in some sense uh, it doesn't matter if we if we like have a local viewpoint or if we, if we have a global global viewpoint. So yeah, this is joint work with Daniel Greb, Kevin Longlois, and Joaquin Moraga, and we will always um, talk about a normal algebraic variety of an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. So let me start um, with defining um, some notions from the title. Probably um, many of you know the notion of log terminal singularities. But let me just quickly remind you of this definition. So we say that such a normal algebraic variety has log terminal singularities um if we take a resolution say f from y to x we can pull back our canonical divisor and if we compare it with the canonical divisor on y then we have some discrepancy which is supported on the exceptional divisor so these ei are uh, prime exceptional divisors and uh, yeah, in this formula, the AI, the coefficients of these exceptional divisors are greater than minus one. So for this, I did not say this, but for this definition, what we need is that our canonical divisor on X has to be Q Cartier. So in order to be able to define these this type of singularities, we need a Q Cartier canonical divisor, uh, or in other terms, we need um, X to be Q Borenstein. Okay, this uh, may be a drawback, and we will fix this later, but uh, let me say for the moment that this definition has something to do with quotients, um, namely, if we consider these kinds of singularities in dimension two, let me abbreviate these log terminal singularities by LT. So LT two dimensional singularities are precisely, so we have a kind of one to one correspondence, are precisely quotients quotients of smooth points by finite subgroups of GL2. So GL2. Okay. Well, um, if the group acts in uh, has a fixed uh, point set of co-dimension one, uh, then this may produce a smooth point again. But uh, so this means we don't have a precise one-to-one uh, -one cor correspondence. But uh, if we ignore these groups um, or these group actions that fix subsets of co-dimension one, then we then we can can say that we have kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so um, well we have. Now these log terminal singularities, so what about reductive quotients? And I will give you a um, definition of reductive groups, which is somehow not the original definition, but 
which fits very well with um, with our in our setting where we where we uh, consider quotients by these groups. Namely, I will say that reductive groups are those linear algebraic groups, so subgroups of GLN are those linear algebraic groups such that for all affine varieties, now let us call them maybe C, with an algebraic G action, so G, as I said, is some subgroup of GLN K, with algebraic G action, we can always define a good uh, invariant theoretic quotient. So we can define say G acts on X and we can define a good quotient, which we denote by this double slash by setting X mod G to be the spec of the algebra of invariants. Okay. D and I call this D. We have C here. D mod G. So here we take just the invariant polynomial functions on G. And the point is that since we have a reductive group, this invariant algebra is always finitely generated. So what we get here is again um, an affine variety which can serve as a quotient. So it makes sense for these reductive groups. There, there are other linear algebraic groups, but it makes sense for these reductive groups to define such an invariant theoretic quotient of, of an affine variety. So somehow these are the groups where it makes sense to to consider the quotient in 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 algebraic geometry so we have for these kinds of quotients we have some rather classical theorems so let me start with one by schutens from 2005 So we consider an action of such a reductive group G. G will always be reductive in the following. And X now is log terminal. So it has log terminal singularities. And I guess we need a fine here. Let me put a fine. So in this case, Schutens proves that if our invariant theoretic quotient as we have defined, uh, is Q Gorenstein. Then it is log terminal. Okay, so this might this might look as if we have already a, a very good theorem. But uh, the problem somehow is that um, quotients, so in general, quotients by reductive group tend to be non Q Gorenstein. So even if X is Q Gorenstein, then it might happen very often then that, uh, that our quotient is not. So for example, even in the toric case. So even if we have um, quotients by by tori, our um, very fast our quotient can be can be non-Q Gorenstein. So maybe what can we do to to remedy this problem? Well, one possibility, and this uh, was proven even before. So if you want, even a long time before the theorem by Schutens, by Bouteau. And it's, it's a rather famous theorem from 1987. 
this says, well, we can uh, consider um, rather uh, a little bit more general class of singularities, namely take the action of a reductive group on a variety with rational singularities. So these rational singularities, if you don't don't know them, then um, well, let me just say they are they are a generalization of log terminal singularities. And Bouteau proved that then our invariant theoretic quotient has rational singularities. So here we don't have um, anything, um, any requirement on the canonical divisor downstairs or upstairs. But the problem somehow is, okay, let me put this again here. So as I said, the log terminal singularities are a subset of rational singularities, which let me formulate it like this. They are still well behaved, rather well behaved, but for example, they lack certain types of vanishing theorems. Um, we don't know so much if MMPs work for these singularities and some other, um, well, so they are still well behaved, but not so well behaved as, as log terminal singularities. Okay, so, so this is one, uh, one variant of this first theorem, and let me give you a third one, which, well, maybe doesn't look so much related, but we will see uh, later that this indeed uh, has something to do with the with the other twos. So, well, let me put classical here. There are like similar versions by different people, and I, I'm, I'm not so sure to whom I should attribute this. What if, um, again, we take some reductive group G acting on X. So what if we impose that X should be factorial? So um, by this, I mean here, just a trivial class group, say. And G, we impose on G uh, to be semi-simple. Then the theorem says that uh, our invariant theoretic quotient is again factorial. So it again has a, a, a trivial class group, which is basically due to the fact that semi-simple groups have no characters. Anyway, um, if we have a look at these, or say maybe at the first two theorems, then a problem somehow is that we cannot assume that our quotient is Q-Gorenstein, but on the other hand, if we generalize to rational singularities, we only get rational singularities on the on the um, on the quotient. So um, we do not have any uh, every good property that we may want to have. So um, well, our our problem with the definition of log terminal singularities was that our canonical divisor needs to be Q-Cartier. So there is um, a remedy for this, namely uh, the following. So the thing is that, say, in birational geometry, we often consider not varieties, but so-called log pairs. So these are pairs consisting of a variety and a divisor. And this, uh, this divisor has coefficients between zero and one. And these are at least initially investigated to, um, to address, say, a junction 
or compare singularities of X and this divisor and so on. But what we will do now is um, we use this additional information of this divisor delta, um, say as a necessary evil, um, to be able to define these lock discrep uh, these discrepancies from our first definition, even if um, to define discrepancies, even if kx is not q cartier. So we are not so much interested in in this in this divisor delta itself, but um, we we just take delta as a small perturbation of our canonical divisor to make it Q Cartier. So the definition is the following. And yeah, probably some of you know this. We say that a pair X delta is KLT, which is short for Kawamata log terminal. If um for a resolution, we can write the following formula. Now we have some strict transform of our delta here. And we pull back kx plus delta. So here we need kx plus delta to be q Cartier. And then we can pull it back and then we compared it. We we compare it with uh, with the canonical on our resolution and a strict transform of delta. And again, um, the difference is supported on our exceptional divisor, and we impose that these AI again should be greater than minus one. So we just use this boundary delta, this divisor delta, as a perturbation of 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 kx. And we are not, I mean, we are not interested at all in where delta comes from. And this is why we say that X is of KLT type. We are only interested in the singularities of X in some sense. X is of KLT type if such delta exists. We are not interested in, 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 how, look, in how delta looks at all. And for these, um, for these types of varieties, we know that all these um, properties of, of varieties with log terminal singularities hold as well. So we have, say, we have very roughly, we have vanishing theorems, the MMP more or less works, etc. Okay. Any questions so far? Very good. Okay. And now let me give the version um, of the theorems we have already seen, which holds for this type of varieties. So this name is theorem four, as I said. It is um, joint work with Daniel Greb, Kevin Longlois, and Joaquin Moraga. And we put this on the archive. Uh, the end of 2021. So let G, as always, reductive act on X, which is of KLT type. And um, so then, and we do not assume X to be a fine at all. We only assume that a good quasi projective, so for example, a GIT quotient, a good quasi projective quotient x mod g and these types of quotients are locally modeled at least locally modeled by these uh, invariant theoretic quotients we have seen so if such a quotient exists it is of klt type so this means 
um, we have somehow this this intermediate KLT type um, singularities are also rational. So we have found a intermediate type of singularities sitting between log terminal and rational singularities that are um, that are um, preserved by GIT quotients and that um, possess all more or less all good uh, properties that the usual log terminal singularities possess. So let me make a few remarks here. So the thing is, as I said, we are not really um, we are not really interested in in this auxiliary divisor delta, and indeed we even do not need delta to be need not be g invariant. So if we find some delta for which uh, X, the pair x delta upstairs is of KLT type, uh, this theorem will work. We need not uh, need no g invariance of delta at all. Then of course. We have a similar statement, this type statement downstairs. So one question is, then how does delta, I will put x mod g in the index, on our quotient x mod g arise? In order for this definition to work, we need some boundary downstairs, some divisor downstairs. And how does it arise? This could be one. One uh, question, and then of course we use this. We have this auxiliar divisor, which is a global object. But on the other hand, like having singularities of a certain of a certain type should be a local statement. So let me put it like this: Delta is a global object. Like at least a priori. So. We could ask ourselves up, uh, if uh, being of KLT type or being KLT pair, is this a local property? So can we find, can we locally find these, these uh, auxiliary devices and construct out of them a global one? And what means locally? So is it Zariski local? Can we find a Zariski uh, open in neighborhoods of, of points, or is it even etal local? So uh, we will also address this question. And then let me remark. So as I said, we've proven this like in December 21 or something. And in, I think, September um, 2022, uh, Sikuan Suang um, put a put an alternative proof on the archive, which uses characteristic P. So our our proof really uses uh, techniques from from algebraic group theory, quotients by algebraic groups, and so on. Where the uh, Sikuan's uh, proof. Day, September 2020 uh, goes via characteristic P and is more uh, more more algebraic, I would say. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to give you an overview of how this proof works, and then I will go into some details. Uh, afterwards, which might be uh, of particular interest. Okay, so let me call this the big picture of the proof, or say of our proof. So what I will do is I will put some situation that we are at the moment. So at the moment we have some reductive group G acting on a variety X, which is of 
KLT type. And then uh, going down, we will reduce to some uh, easier cases. So our first reduction step is that we can assume we are in the situation that X is affine. And here we, in order to be able to do this uh, reduction, we use a proposition that we proved at least in this form in the same paper. Namely, we proved that being KLT, okay, one direction is easy, means we are the risky locally KLT. Okay, we can we can if we have such. So the, the problem is, of course, what, what happens with the boundary. We have a global boundary, then we have local boundaries. So we always have the risky neighborhoods. And this, of course, means that we also have ETAL, ETAL um, local neighborhoods for all points, which are KLT. So these directions are clear, but what we prove is that this is being ital locally KLT uh, is equivalent to being the risky locally KLT. And so for this, we need quasi projectivity. So if we are quasi projective, then from being the risky locally KLT, we can construct a global divisor delta. But this only holds if we are in a quasi projective. Um, setting, which means, or let me say that here, this is the reason why we need quasi-projectivity. So if we have a good quotient, which is not quasi-projective, then, um, then we can still say that our quotient uh, is the risky locally of KLT type. But uh, well, we, we need quasi-projectivity to construct downstairs a global uh, divisor delta out of local divisors. Um, but the, the, most of the good properties also hold if we are only so risky locally uh, KLT. Anyway, um, now we have this reduction um, that we can assume X to be a fine. Of course, we need it if, if we have, uh, if we have a, um, a covering upstairs by a fine X, then downstairs we have a covering of the invariant theoretics of these uh, invariant theoretic quotients of these x. So somehow this is how this reduction works. And um, by using this locality of, of KLT plus uh, the Luna et al. slice theorem, We can do the following reduction, namely, we can assume that we are in the case that we have one fixed point, so fixed with respect to the action of G X. So more or less this slice theorem says that if, if we have some part of G that translates points, then downstairs um, we can we can take um, we can take, um, yeah, the, the, the quotient somehow is modeled locally by uh, quotients that are transverse and that that part of G that fixes points. And um, if, and this is very important, uh, if the if our point X is in a closed orbit of G, and in every pre-image we have a closed orbit, then the part of G that fixes these points is reductive again. If we have an open orbit, we cannot say something about reductivity, but since we always have a closed orbit in the pre-image of every point, um, we always have some, uh, the, the part of G that fixes our point is always reductive. So, so we can do this reduction and we still can assume that, that G is reductive. So, in this uh, setting, now the following reduction, these were reductions con concerning X in some sense. So, so we simplified X. 
And um, now we, we simplify our group G. So um, linear reductive groups are made up in a, in a, in a particular way. So, and the good thing is that we can, we can um, quotient step by step by these building parts of linear reductive groups. Namely, we can take the identity component and we can first quotient by the identity component, which is a connected group. Component of G. And afterwards, we um, we quotient by the group of components, which is a finite group, of course. So we have somehow divided up our big quotient in a quotient by a connected group and a and the group of components, so a quotient by a finite group, and we can. Um, we have a further subdivision of this identity component, namely we can take the derived subgroup, which is a semi-simple group, and the quotient of the identity component by the derived subgroup, and this gives us a torus. So, in fact, we have three different cases, quotienting by three different groups, by finite groups, by tori, and by uh, semi-simple groups. And this is exactly the, the reduction. So the first case and easiest case, we assume that G is finite. So this is the case of the group of components. And this is pretty much standard and was known before. And in this case, we can um, produce G invariant boundaries, the boundary divisors upstairs. So if delta is not, so we can find some delta upstairs which makes X KLT. And if this delta is not G invariant, we take the following G invariant boundary, namely, well, this is pretty clear, we should take the sum over all G translations of delta. I mean, we have a finite group, so we will get a well-defined divisor and we just divide by the order of G. And if we have such, uh, if we have such a G invariant divisor delta, and it, it's pretty easy to, to see that the pair X delta G is KLT if, if the pair X delta was KLT. And then there is, for example, uh, uh, in the book, um, Variational Geometry of Algebraic Varieties by Collar and Mori, you have, I think it's proposition 5.20, and then this already gives you the result that the quotient is KLT in this case. And the boundary comes directly from, from the boundary um, upstairs. So yeah, since this is already known, I do not want to say so much about this. Uh, so let's come to the, to the second case, and the second case, or maybe second easiest case, is the case that G is an algebraic torus. And here we do another simplification, again for X, namely that we can consider the case that X is canonical Gorenstein. And um, this is done by something that will be of interest. Say we lift the action of T to the local, uh, to the local Cox space. I will explain this at our fixed point X and X. So um, I will go into the details later, but what I mean by Cox space, maybe um, let me just say the following. Um, you get some covering 
which is uh, in code I mentioned too, uh, principal G bundle for, for another group G, namely, okay, a principal HX bundle. Let me denote this group by HX. This has something to do with their local class group at our, at our fixed point. And this group is a direct product of another algebraic torus T prime and a finite abelian group A. Okay, so what we are interested in, of course, is our quotient by our torus X mod T. So here, um, but now we can lift the action of this torus T on X to X hat. And the, the thing is that uh, this Cox space has log terminal singularities has even Gorenstein canonical singularities if X is KLT. So this is exactly the, um, the reduction we do here. We lift T to X hat, and then we have an action by the product of our initial torus T and this new torus, which is part of this group um, HX T prime. So this is again is an algebraic torus. So instead of the action of T on X, we consider the action of T times T prime on, on X hat, which is canonical Gorenstein. And we get some quotient, which I denote by Y here. And then, as I said, um, we can somehow subdivide all these quotients. And X mod T now is just nothing else than the quotient of Y by this finite abelian group A. So this means maybe I call this A, I call this B. So since we have already proven A, we know that if Y is KLT, then X mod T is KLT as well, as well by point A. And um, well, what we still have to prove, we have to prove that the quotient of a canonical Gorenstein um, a fine variety by a torus has KLT singularities. So this, um, okay, let me maybe do it as some another um, reduction. This holds, so in this holds, uh, in this uh, setting, um, our statement holds by the theory of say polyhedral, divisors um, plus canonical bundle formula. So I don't want to say anything more formula here, but let me just say that, that in this canonical Gorenstein um, uh, setting, we can use these these techniques to prove that our quotient Y has KLT singularities. But what will be more interesting, I hope, is the third case. So our third case is that we quotient by this derived subgroup. So we can say that G is a semi-simple group. So this will be case C. Um, and here we do something similar, but slightly more general or more complicated as, as in the Taurus case. Namely, what we do is we lift the group action by G, not to the local Cox space, but to the so-called Iterated, iterated local Cox space um, at again at our fixed point x and x. So somehow this means just that we we take this construction um, of the Cox space and we iterate it. So we then we take the local Cox space of X hat, X double hat, and so on. And we can do this, and I will 
in a few minutes uh, tell you how this is done roughly. So what we achieve by this is that um, I said that if you take the Cox space one time that you get a canonical Gorenstein variety, which may not be factorial. But if you iterate this, then after finitely many steps, you get a factorial space. So by this reduction, we can assume or at least assume that some pre-image of x in this iterate in this iterated space is a factorial um, is a factorial point. And maybe you remember our one of our theorems from, from the beginning, namely that we know by theorem three that if we have the action of a semi-simple group um, on a factorial variety, so this is some discrepancy to, to our setting. There we had x was factorial, and now we only have a factorial point. Um, then the quotient is factorial again. So for this, we need to do a little bit, but then um, we also get our statement in the case of a quotient by a semi-simple group. And I will talk about this step and I will talk about what happens here in the following. Okay, but maybe before I do that, are there any, any questions to this diagram? No, very good. Okay, so yeah, as I said, first I will tell you about, um, or at least about the statement which uh, which we use in this factorial case, and then I will tell you a little bit about this iterated local Cox space um, of say KLT points. Okay, so. So one follows from a variant of this classical uh, theorem three that we proved in our paper, and it says the following. So basically we are more or less in our setting. So we have a fixed point X, in a variety with the action of a semi-simple group G. And we want this point to be factorial. Okay, so only our point X is a factorial point, which means that the local class group of small X is, is trivial, but capital X, our variety may have, uh, may have, may have a big, class group, for example. Then we prove that um, they, we call our quotient morphism pi and we take um, the image of our point X There exists um, an open, a fine, locally factorial, which means um, either, so equivalently, either every point in this, in this, spa in a locally factorial spa space is factorial or um, the, let me see, the Picard group equals the divisor class group. So there exists such a neighborhood um, U of the image of X. So this means you have one factorial point upstairs, then downstairs 
around the image, you can find a neighborhood which is locally factorial, so such that every um, such that every uh, a point is vectorial. And this means that um, that this means in particular that on you, your canonical divisor is Cartier because the Picard group equals the class group. So you take a canonical divisor, you know it is Cartier. And now what we use in addition, if we assume here that X is KLT, then this means in particular that X is rational. Okay, so what we proved um, in the first place is everything that is written in black. And if you ad assume in addition that X is KLT, then we know that X is rational. And this means that um, by theorem, uh, let me see, theorem two, by this classical theorem by Bouteau, this means that U is rational. But um, since it's locally factorial, uh, I already said that uh, say KU is Q Cartier, at least even Cartier. So this means it is rational and Gorenstein. And this means nothing else than it has canonical singularities. So this is a rather classical statement. And in particular, canonical singularities are, are KLT. So by using this proposition and um, well, what I sketched, uh, this means that indeed we can prove that in the case of a factorial of a factorial X, we have proven our statement. Okay, any any questions? So far, no, very good. Then let me come in the last few minutes to the iteration of local Cox rings, especially um, in our setting. And this is something, um, so we use some work, some joint work again with Joaquin Moraga from 2001, where we defined local Cox rings and their and their iteration. Well, if you if you know the classical definition of a Cox ring, I will just recall it shortly. So what we need is we need a finally generated class group of some variety X. Then we define the Cox ring to be um, this direct sum of divisorial sheaves. Maybe this is this is sometimes called a Cox sheaf, and you can take global sections. So what you can also do is you can just take sections, and then you get a Cox ring. And if this is finitely generated, so if R X is finitely generated. Then we have this Cox space. We just take the spec of this Rx. Here we should take the relative spec over X if we consider only, well, I prefer the sheaf notation because it fits better with this definition. Um, so you take the relative spec of this sheaf and you get exactly this Cox space, which is a quotient by this group HX. As you might remember, this is just the direct product of a torus and a finite abelian group. And this directly comes from our class group. So this is the spec of the group algebra of our finitely generated class group. However, so I mean, if you don't 
if you notice, you are familiar with it. If you don't notice, you can just remember that that uh, with this construction, um, we can produce a kind of covering of our variety X, um, which has some nice property. So um, let me maybe give you the following statement. So if you start, and this is, uh, yeah, as I said, um, classically somehow, um, these Cox rings are, are global objects. So they are considered for varieties, for projective varieties. So the first, um, the first uh, global statements uh, in in the in the direction I want to I want to give you is that for example if you take a Fano variety, then you have the following statements about the 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 Cox ring. So by the very famous work of Birka, Cascini, Haken, and McKernan around 2009, we know that in the Fano case this Cox ring is finitely generated and it is log terminal by work of Gongyo, Okawa, Sanai, and Takagi, and independently by Morgan Brown. So, so these are global statements about Fano type varieties. And in particular, what we have done in this joint work with Joaquin um, is we we defined um, this notion of Cox ring for singularities. So you can imagine if you have a singularity and you take say for example you can take the spec of the of the Zariski local ring then you have a class group and you can you can if it, if this class group is finally generated then you can um, define this cox ring and then you don't have finite generation but you have maybe finite generation over the local ring of your singularity so this local ring is not finally generated but it is a sub ring of your Cox ring, and you 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 have relative finite generation if you want, and it is even not a local ring, but a graded local ring. Still, you can define its singularities, and the point is that if you start with KLT singularities, which are somehow the the local counterpart to Fano type varieties, because if you have a a projective Fano type variety, and you take the cone over it, then at the coin point, you will get a KLT singularity. So they have a lot in common. So let me call these singularities XX. Maybe for XX, you just take the spec of the local ring. We have for the Cox ring, and this yeah comes out of the joint work with Joaquin. This is, as I said, a so-called graded, graded local ring, finitely generated over the local ring at X. And it is canonical Gorenstein. So this somehow generalizes in a certain sense these, these global statements. It is canonical Gorenstein, but as soon as your um, class group upstairs is not trivial, is so so your space upstairs is not factorial, you can iterate this process. And the statement is the following. Even if we only have these graded local rings, in this local setting iteration of let me just put it as a slogan of Cox rings is possible. And finite, which means it stops after finitely many steps with, yeah, just let me put it as a slogan with factorial endpoints. So in the end, we end up with a factorial singularity. Plus, we always can lift uh actions of connected groups at least so now i will prove 
this item two by say a small picture. So we have X here. And yes, yeah, I said we can do this this Cox construction. You can think of of the local picture or a global picture. Everything works out uh, interchangeably if you want. And here we have this quotient by by HX by this uh, abelian reductive group HX. And now let's say X hat is not yet factorial, so we can iterate our procedure. It means we get another Cox space X double hat and here we have x h x hat and say that our iteration ends after two after two steps so we have a factorial x double hat this means that we can we can lift the action say here we have t prime no just call it t uh, times a, and here maybe we have t two times a two. So we can you can imagine we can lift the action of t to x double hat. So this means we get a quotient by this torus t times t two, and this again gives us a quotient maybe y two. Here we have a quotient of x hat by the action of t, and we have already seen that quotienting here, we have an action of, of, of a on y, and quotienting here gives us back x. And here you can imagine, maybe we put the two downstairs. Here you can imagine that um, we just have to quotient by our finite abelian group A2. So somehow this is the setting of this iteration of Cox rings, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to quotient by the by um, the action of our semi-simple group. And we wanted to prove that X mod G is has KLT singularities. So we can stepwise if you want lift the action of G first to x hat and then to x double hat. And we know that x double hat is in fact only locally factorial at some pre-image, at some point x hat. So here when we quotient by x, uh, we can call this x double hat mod g. Then we know that this is KLT or even has canonical Gorenstein singularities by our proposition one. Well, and then you can imagine here, you have to prove that again, you have an action of H X hat. Here you get X hat mod G and you get this nice diagram. And the point is that this X H uh, hat is a direct product of a torus and an abelian group. So by our steps one, we have proven our statement for finite groups and for tori. So we know that again here, we are KLT by one and two. And well, we do this just a second time by HX. And now we know that X mod G uh, is KLT or is of KLT type. And this more or less means that we have proven the last step. Okay. So I did not, I was not able to, to give you any uh, applications, but uh, I was more or less able to finish the, the proof. So I'm done. Thanks.